He's got a billion ways for you to come to Him. God has one way. God has always had one way. And Jesus said, I am that way. Okay? God never changes. If you do not come to God according to God's way, then are you coming to God? Think back of the two sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Did God make it clear how God was to be approached to them? So, Cain came to God, had an offering. Abel came to God and had an offering. And whose offering did God accept? Why did he not accept Cain's? So, is our God particular in his requirements? For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. For you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Verse 6. You ever find this a strange text? For the Lord loves... For whom the Lord loves, he what? I can deal with chasing, but it's that next two words that are kind of hard. What else does he do? He chastens you and he does what? What does that word mean? You ever been beat up by God? Raise your hand if you've ever been beat up by God. Raise your hand if you need to be beat up by God. So is God loving and just in scourging his children? Yes. Do you understand why that happens? It's because of our sinful nature. Your sinful nature that you're born with will drive you away from God. And it will do it in very overt ways and very covert ways. Before you gave your life to Christ, it did it in overt ways. You didn't care. But when you become a Christian, now the sinful nature works in more subtle ways. And it deceives you, and it lies to you, and it tries to get you to do things that you know are bad for you. And you say no, you say no, you say no, and then boom, in a moment of weakness and unbelief, you fall into temptation and sin. Oh, you rationalize. Let me ask you a question. When that happens, what does God do? Does God turn his back on you? Does God kick you out of his presence? Or does God, through his Holy Spirit, chase you even more to bring you back? I've been trying to tell my son this. The reason why your life is such a mess, the reason why things go wrong every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, is because when you were a child, you dedicated your life to Christ, and now you've run... You've run away from him. And because you've run away from him, God is trying to get your attention. God's not going to get your attention by letting everything go easy and smooth because you'll never turn in. So how does he do it? God does not bring all these bad things in your life. What God does is draw his protection away from you. And now Satan is allowed to run havoc. Do you understand this devil that you think is so much fun, who brings so much joy to your life, is actually the one causing you all these problems? He's not your friend. He's not your buddy. He wants nothing but to destroy you. You young people that are here, understand what I'm saying. Because all of us old people that are here, we've been where you're at. And from experience, we know. We know what you're going to go through. We know the temptations that are coming. We know how powerful the world and its straw is, but we also know the emptiness of it. We know the vanity of sin. You're going to have to figure these things out yourself. You will fail. You will fail if you do not keep your hand grasped to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Do you understand? I could preach on that forever. <laughs> understand what I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, so are any of you wondering, so what happened to you when a teacher got you out of your seat? Anybody? So, I'm looking at my friends, and I got two of them, they sit side by side, and they're laughing because they don't know what's going to happen. And I'm sweating so bad that the bottom of my shoes are wet inside of them. <laughs> because sweat is affected by gravity and everything runs downhill, right? And nobody else heard it, but when I'm walking up there, I can hear my feet sloshing inside my shoes because I'm so scared. And I get up there, and I'm supposed to read the book, and I'm looking at the words, and I can't... I can't make out what they're saying. Have you ever had that? Anybody here suffer from dyslexia? And you know what I'm talking about? You look at it, and it's like, what, what is this? So... The story in the book was titled The Really Red Rubber Weather. <laughs> yes, what? <laughs> speech impediments. I had to go through speech classes throughout elementary school because I could not say R's and W's. And so what book did I have to read? The Really Red Rubber Rabbit. But when I got up there, I couldn't see what it was saying, but I knew what it said because I studied this and I studied this and I went over it and I went over it and I went over it. And I got up there and I said, the title of the book is The Willy Red Rubber Rabbit. <laughs> and everybody laughed. And I couldn't read anything after that. And teachers, you gotta love them because it's like, why did you do this to me in the first place? <laughs> but that's part of their job, is to, you gotta get up there. But what do I do today? I'm here, I speak, but I have to constantly be thinking and focusing on what I'm saying so that it comes out correct. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of concentration. And then the problem is, is if your brain runs at like a thousand miles an hour and you've got eight things in there that you're wanting to say, you've already said it in your head, but it hasn't come out your mouth yet. And you're trying to keep all that together. This is a really, really confusing place to start. <laughs> humiliation. That was my really first taste of humiliation. I realized I didn't like it. And after we got done, I said to myself, I'm never going to do that again. Um, and, and I grew up making sure that I didn't get put in those positions. I never liked to be humiliated. But you know what? You know what God realized that I needed? Humiliation. Not humility, humiliation. Because humiliation brought me into a spirit of submission. A spirit of, this is, this is your real state. Know it, understand it, and then come to me and I will restore you. This, brothers and sisters, is why I am a Christian because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished in me. If you were to read my school records for most of my teachers, they weren't positive. And the, the future was not a positive one. Jail was mentioned in a lot of them. Oh, wow. As you got older, you know what I'm saying? But look where I'm at today. Do you know why? Is it because of me? No. This is what Jesus Christ will do for you. You guys are getting ready to be baptized, right? You're wanting to give your hearts to Jesus Christ. And at your age right now, you've got a lot of life and a lot of learning, a lot of experiences ahead of you. And you're either going to do that in a spirit of belief in Christ, or you're going to be drawn away and you're going to make decisions in unbelief. Are you familiar with the history of the nation of Israel? Okay. Are you guys familiar with the history of Israel? Okay. 
The majority of their time, was it spent in belief or unbelief? unbelief. How well did that work for them? Okay? Now, two examples. Do you remember when God brought them right to the threshold of the promised land? And he sent the spies in? The spies spied out the land. They came back. They had bushels of grapes on their backs that were so huge. They were all happy about that aspect. But when the spies gave their testimony, what they saw, what they heard, how many gave a good report? And how many gave a bad report? Okay? The one of those spies that gave the good report, his name was Caleb. Are you familiar with him? Do you know that when Joshua brought them into the promised land, when God brought them again the second time, and Joshua now is their leader, what did Caleb say to Joshua when it came to dividing the land? What land did Caleb want? The one the giants. Huh! Say it loud, sister. The one with the giants. Do you realize that this was the land that the nation said, there's giants in the land, and we're like grasshoppers in front of them. They'll step on us. We can't go in there. Caleb, you know how old he was at that time? Anybody know how old Caleb was? 85? 85. 85! And what did he say to Joshua? This is the land that I want, and through the power of God, I will drive out the giants. At how old? 85. You know the Bible says that his strength did not fail him when he was 85. He said it was the same as when he was 40, 45. That's what faithfulness to God will do for you. Do you also know that two chapters after that story, children of Manasseh? Manasseh was Ephraim. They were one of the biggest tribes. Hold on. Turn to Joshua. Turn to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua 14, I'll start at verse 9. Joshua 14, verse 9. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot is trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. This is Caleb speaking. And he said, These 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. Verse 11. And yet I am as strong this day as on that day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for what? For. For. Both for going out and coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard that, that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive him out, as the Lord has said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb as an inheritance. Did Caleb go into that land, and did he chase out and subdue that land? Yeah. Did he chase out the giants? Okay, so let me find it here. I'm going to turn over... To chapter 17. Verse 1 says, There was also a lot for the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph. Namely for, whatever that name is, uh, you can read all that, but it's the tribe of Manasseh. Skip down to verse 4. And they came near before Eleazar the priest, before Joshua the son of Nun, and before the rulers, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers. Ten shares. 
So keep that in mind. Skip down to verse 14. Then the children of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit, since we are a what? A great people. You get that? Did Caleb say anything about the greatness of his people? But the sons of Joseph saying, you didn't give us enough land. It's not big enough because we're a great people. They had the most people in all the tribes. So they come to Joshua, and what do they want? More land. More land. So let's keep reading. I love Joshua's uh, response to them. Why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit? Since we are a great people, inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us until now. So Joshua answered them. You got to love this answer. If you are a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourselves there in the land of the Perizzites and the giants, since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you. But the children of Joseph said, now I want you to see the difference between Caleb and the children of Joseph. This is the difference between belief and unbelief. This is the difference between what God can do for you and in you. And what he won't do if you don't believe. But the children of Joseph said, The mountain country is not enough for us. Oh, and besides, all the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley, they have chariots of iron. Both those who are at Beth Shean and its towns and those who are of the valley of Jezreel. So what was the actual problem with the children of Joseph? They were scared. They were afraid. Why? Not because they didn't have enough land, it's just that the land they had had giants in it, and they were afraid that they couldn't drive them out. Who was it that promised they would drive them out? Was it them that had to fight that battle? No. Now listen, this is a really good example of faith and works and how this works. Did God tell them, sit in your house, I will drive them out? Or did God say, I will drive them out, but they had to show up? Yes. Did they not have to go out? Yes. Did they not have to make war? But who gave them the victory? God. They had to actually choose to step out in faith so that God could do what God was going to do. Caleb did that, and God blessed him. And God drove out all the giants in his part of the land. The children of Joseph never got over their unbelief. They gained certain victories, but they never drove out the Canaanites all the way. What was the result of that? Say it loud, because somebody was right. What was the result of them not doing what God said and driving them Canaanites out? Were they not a continual thorn in the flesh? Of the Israelites? Yeah. Did they not continuously cause them to fall back into sin and unbelief? Okay. So, as I close this morning, I want you to look. Let's look real quick at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Patty, you have that? No, Philippians. Patty, Patty Duff, can you find that? Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Let's 
going to be Isaiah 53, verses 2 through 5. You got that title? Verses what? 2 through 5. For he shall grow up before him as a gentle plant, and as a root out of the ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is a beauty that we shall desire him. And there is no beauty that we shall should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, chapter 5. This is where we'll close. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Did you guys actually read what she just read in Isaiah? Did you get the part where it says it pleased God to do this to his own son? I want you to think about that. I want you to think of the humiliation that Jesus went through on that cross. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If Jesus was willing to do it, the Father would have done it as well as the Holy Spirit. As you get into Romans, I want you to think about, again, what God has done for you. The love that He has for you. And as we finish up this morning, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for who? For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, he, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. Verse 10. For if when we were... What's that word? Enemies. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So brothers and sisters, you take those texts, meditate on them. Meditate on what God has actually done for you, accomplished in you, the doors that He's opened for you. Why? When He crucified Christ, what was He wearing on the crucifixion, or at the crucifixion? The humiliation of God. And He went through all that so that you and I as sinners can be saved can be changed and can be at this point, at this time in earth's history to be that people who are not wanting to see him in death, but are preparing to meet him in life. The cozy hymn this morning is hymn number 318.